Okay. Well, I'm Bridget Wallace, and thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces out there. And uh, I'm so happy to be doing this with uh, Dr. Shear, Charlie Shear. Uh, we've known each other uh, quite a while now. And it's just, it's just an honor to have him. So I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping items here and go over just some of the objectives, which are, we're, we're going to talk about some clinical applications. We're going to let uh, Charlie give you the science behind this conversation, and it's a brief look at it. And then I'm going to just use a patient sample Today, we're going to specifically talk about um, working with someone. Well, I'm going to use a, an example of working with someone with visually induced uh, dizziness using Vertex uh, Vision Trainer. Uh, again, Charlie's going to be in developer of the BVT uh, and so many other things. For any of you ha that have bought anything from Burnell, uh, neuro optometry, optometry training or assessment supplies. Uh, Charlie probably had a big uh, place in creating that. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of scanning, the, the central to peripheral uh, visual integration. And then I do have one patient sample that I'm going to review, but I'm going to just briefly discuss how this um, particular equipment or these theories can be used across multiple uh, patient populations. And so I'm again, so happy to introduce Dr. Sh uh, Charlie Shear. He is a neuro optometrist, uh, has been practicing for over 30 years. He's locally, nationally uh, recognized as a leader in the area of, of vision therapy, vision related learning problems, sports vision enhancement, and certainly in the development of so many products that we use today in both assessment and in, in therapy. He has worked with US athletes and teams, professional amateur athletes, coordinated national screening of both the Special Olympics and Junior Olympics. He's a leader in the field of instrumentation development related to his role. He's uh, the director of research and development for Burnell and has worked with other companies, uh, again, such as Burtec. He was born in North Liberty, Indiana, received his optometry degree from Indiana University and went Charlie returned, he resumed care of patients um, who are retiring from a colleague. I'm gonna let someone in the room here. I'm sorry about that. He re relocated his practice and throughout his career, he's had a particular interest in pediatric vision, vision training and vision perceptual problems. He has a huge interest in um, sports vision and particularly related to concussion. And I knew he wouldn't be able to get through this talk without uh, relating a couple of things to, to concussion. So welcome, 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 a friend and a colleague. And it, it looks like, um, Charlie, I'm gonna go ahead and admit a few more people into the room. And then um, looks like I'm gonna have to advance the slides for you. Is that gonna be okay? Sure, whenever you're okay. ready. Let's see when I'm ready. I'm gonna open up the chat box so I can watch that. Well, when Bridget asked me to participate with this talk and she came up with the title, Shift Happens, uh, how can you <laughs> refuse, you know? So <laughs> we had a lot of fun with this one. And hopefully we don't offend anyone and we'll try to be careful. All right. Okay, there you go, Charlie. Well, this is not a uh, presentation for neuro nerds, even though we sometimes kind of get stuck in that role ourselves. Uh, this basically is to try to give you some feel for how the central vision and the peripheral vision integrate together and, and why we have troubles with vision motion sensitivity. Um, the, there are three basic cell groups, ganglion groups in the brain that relate to vision as, as it relates to this topic. And the ones you hear most about um, are magno cells and parvo cells, M cells and P cells. But there's also one that uh, you don't hear much about called K cells. And we'll mention that briefly. Now, um, 
photoreceptors in their gangs, uh, and that means ganglion cell systems, of course. You know, uh, we all know about rods and cones. The rods are responsible for our peripheral vision, the low light, the black and white kinds of things. And there are magnocell or M cell um, system. They are very fast, very sensitive to contrast, and very transient. Um, they really are motion detector system. And that's why when people have trouble with uh, hypersensitivity in their peripheral vision leading to balance and other issues, um, it's usually the peripheral vision, that M cell system that's responsible. Cones are our central vision. They're our color vision. They're our 2020 sharp vision. They're, they're slower than the M cells. Um, they're the P cell system. And they require a lot of light. So they don't work well in the dark. The K cells or coniocellular cells, we hardly ever hear about, but they may have they may be playing a bigger role in concussion and stroke than what we've thought in the past. It's really a third type of pathway. Um, I said I mentioned stepchildren because they uh, uh, are rarely talked about and hard to understand sometimes, I guess. So the conio cells um, also are short wavelength blue cone cells, of course. And, um, and they've also been linked to somatosensory integration where they lie in the lateral geniculate body is right between the M cells and the P cells. And they may integrate those two systems as well. And for those of you who have used blue filters in the past, um, this may be one of the reasons among many that uh, blue filters and different specific filters work. It's basically is that you detect something in your peripheral vision and the signal is sent to the brain and says, okay, look over there and see what that is. If that's within 17 degrees from center, you'll usually just make an eye movement, eye movement, excuse me. Beyond 17 degrees, you usually will have to make a head movement, which involves stimulation to the inner ear and to the neck muscles. Um, once the fixation is received and the P cell system um, basically is, responsible for understanding what's there. It has to process that information. And a cell is then sent back to the peripheral vision and says, go pick up the next target. So if you can imagine in reading, for instance, the peripheral vision picks up the next word, guides the eyes over to see it. As the eyes go over to see it and understand it, a, a, a signal is sent to the peripheral vision and says, hey, go pick up the next one. And uh, you'll, you'll see a little subtitle up on top that timing is everything. Uh, and that's really very, very true. It's been shown that uh, concussion and reading disabilities and other things affect the timing between those two systems. You know, maybe the uh, peripheral vision signal is not erased in time or they're missed match. Um, there was a study done by Harold Solon at SUNY University. It was the, um, dynamic MRI, and it showed that you could adjust the timing of these two systems with the use of blue filters, for instance. And we all know about blue filters, blue light, because today's smartphones, tablets, computers are all ex um, emitting a lot of near blue and blue light. Near blue light is not quite ultraviolet, but it's non-visible and it's below the blue wavelength. Um, we all have lots of patients who post-concussion or stroke have a lot of trouble with the, the screens. So there's maybe some correlation there we can look for there. And just a, a brief anatomy lesson here. And again, I'll try not to get too deep into this, but you know, the, the eyes are in the front of the head, obviously, but we all know the visual cortex is the very back of the head, that, that bump on the back of the head called the external occipital protuberance. I always have the little kids say that, that's fun. That's a bump on outside of head. Um, that's where your visual cortex is. So all those nerve fibers spread out through the whole brain and come back together there. And about halfway through that picture, you'll see the lateral geniculate body. That, that's a big deal for, for the neurooptometrist. That's where the two systems, the M, or the three systems actually, the M cells, P cells, and K cells all come together and kind of work and that's also where it starts to integrate with the rest of the brain. Uh, just a, a, a brief comment about peripheral vision loss versus neglect. 
Uh, many of you have heard the term neglect. And when we have neglect, the patient is ignoring usually one half of the visual system, usually to the left side. Um, there's a difference between actual damage to the nerve pathway, such as a stroke that damages the uh, pathway or radiations, where they, no matter what, they can't see any image there. That, that extension cord's been cut. Um, neglect is different. Neglect is they, they have function there. They just can't pay attention to it. So when there's damage to the nerve system in the pathway, it's rarely able to be improved but we're getting better and better as we know more about plasticity of the brain to help treat some of these neglect patients. Um, one thing that, that we learn very quickly in optometry is that we can find out where in the brain a, uh, a lesion is occurring by the type of the visual field loss. And I'll show you in the next slide, but for example, um, if a patient loses the outside of the right eye and the outside of the left eye, that's called bitemporal hemianopsia. The only wear in the brain that that could possibly occur is in the uh, cella tursica or where the pituitary gland is pushing up on the optic chiasm. So when we have a patient come in and I've had several um, with bitemporal hemianopsia, we know right, right away that they have a pituitary tumor and you can guide the um, uh, imaging people as to where to look. Um, a lot of times too, when we have visual field loss, we have what we call macular sparing. They may lose the whole left side of a visual field, but right in the center, they will have um, some of their very best vision left. And if you look down at the bottom of that slide, you'll see um, some representations of what I was talking about. And you can see if you had a, for instance, a, a stroke or damage at location six there, um, that's the kind of uh, visual field loss it will cause. Now, now that we've got all that stuff out of the way, a little, little history, um, I, we really will talk about VMS. Uh, if you wanna hit, the, there we go. Um, we have this old joke, Bridget and I, when we talk together, we always wanna be the first one to say, when you've seen one concussion, you've seen one concussion. Uh, it, basically every patient's different as you know, and it's hard to cookbook any of these things that I'm gonna tell you. Come in the office yet, so. Uh, but one of the very first things that we like to do is of course, start with an eye exam. And um, sometimes overlooked is the eye health exam. When you've had a patient with trauma um, you assume it's a brain injury, but you better look into the eyes because I've detected retinal detachments and uh, other uh, damage, uh, shaken baby syndrome and, and different kinds of things. So we, we've got to start by making sure the eye is healthy. Then we look at the binocular vision. Do we have both eyes working together? In concussion, about 60 to 70% of patients have what we call convergence insufficiency or an inability to cross their eyes. Um, that is sometimes temporary, about two thirds of the time that will clear up within a month or two. That last third of the time we need to deal with that with vision therapy. Then we do an eye movement evaluation, a peripheral vision test, and a quick balance test. Um, I do the Romberg test with every patient, even if they've been seen, just because I want to see it for myself. And then of course we have the Vertec balance uh, equipment to do a more thorough digital kind of exam. But the most important part of any exam, yours or mine, is the case history. It's, it's being a good listener and finding out what kind of patients, or what kind of problems those patients are having. Things that we can do for the patient that I, I call uh, visual crutches. In other words, they're not cures, but we're gonna help them compensate for these problems. Um, sometimes they need glasses to clear up the distance. That's the simple one. Um, often they need a different pair of glasses for reading, particularly if they have convergence problems and need prisms. Prisms is a whole uh, topic to itself. Um, what prisms do basically is shift the light up, down, right, left, um, or they can be made to help with convergence or divergence problems. The other thing we evaluate on almost every patient today is scotopic sensitivity tints and filters. 
Um, those are the blue tents, yellow tents, green tents. Um, and we go through an evaluation with that. That probably affects somewhere between 10 to 20% of the patients that I see. And it tends to be a temporary kind of thing, but it does uh, really make a difference in some patients. The other thing that we can do to help with vision motion sensitivity in glasses is what we call binasal or bitemporal occlusion. And that's simply putting some frosted tape uh, right near the uh, nose there, if it's binasal, so that the right eye cannot see the peripheral vision or the, to the left side and the left side can't see the peripheral vision to the right. And that tends to give them some relief um, by, by temporal with that vision in that eye. Um, recently, I've been making up what we call contrast reduction glasses where we use a neutral density filter out in the periphery to gradually blur out or reduce the contrast in the periphery to help them. And then I had a very wise OT showed me one time, have the patients wear hoodies. So in some patients, when it's really severe, like going into a grocery store, they'll actually put on hoodies and bring them up forward to kind of restrict their peripheral vision, reducing the vision motion sensitivity. I want to go ahead and play that, Bridget, and I'll talk over it here. Um, I want to give you a, a demonstration as to how contrast affects motion in your vision. And uh, I've got to look at a real small screen here for a second, but um, what you're going to see is what we call a stepping stone or stepping shoe um, optical illusion. Now, those two blocks that you see moving across that gradient are moving together at exactly the same speed. But the optical illusion is created by the difference in contrast between the targets and the background. And there's a lot of things that affect that. You can change the spatial frequency. Did it stop there? There we go. Um, you can change the contrast, which is the biggest effect. You can change the speed. But when you look at two different targets against the same background and they act differently and they jump and they move and they create problems for the patient, you can see where contrast can make a big difference. The um, reduction of contrast with just tinted lenses helps in some patients. Sometimes we need to be more specific. But you'll see here in a second when we start changing these backgrounds how they have an effect too. So when we put those things closer together, you see how it jumps more? It's making more jumps, so it's much jumpier. So you imagine walking down a grocery aisle and uh, there's a lot in the periphery, it's gonna move more. And then if we have a, a, a wider uh, spatial frequency where we have more spacing between the targets, even though those two bars are moving at exactly the same speed as the previous ones you saw, they look like they're going much slower. And you'll see that if we change the backgrounds um, to have wider spaces in between and just thinner stripes, how that has an effect. Notice if we make both of them the same color, they, they move together. I don't know if you can see it well enough on the screen, but uh, towards the bottom, there's a little red dot that's moving right across the screen with the uh, stepping stones. And it's moving at the same rate and just as smoothly as the stepping stones are, but you don't notice it jump. So when we have patients who have all of these problems in their peripheral vision, the, the environment that they're in has a big effect. The, the more stripes in the environment, in other words, the more stuff out there to pay attention to, uh, the type of target they're looking at, the colors of things, the contrast, the lighting, all of those things can, can play into vision motion sensitivity. But far and away, the most important one is contrast. So treatments that we do, that patients can do for themselves, as I like to say, or vision therapy. Um, first of all, we try to solve their binocular vision problems. We want to make sure both eyes are working together. They're both lined up in the same place at the same time because if they converge and diverge or lose fixation, uh, it's only gonna add to the problem. 
Then we do um, saccadic and tracking eye movement therapies. Um, as most of you know, saccadic eye movements are jump eye movements. They're the eye movements we make when we read, for instance. Um, we jump from one word to another. And remember, that's all guided by the M cell, P cell kind of system. And then tracking movements, of course, are like following your finger. It's slow motions. Um, then we do VOR exercise, which is you guys are better at than probably I am. We do visual motor integration uh, types of therapies, and that's where the BVT comes in. Uh, the BVT is a, a really unique instrument. It not only lets us train eye-hand coordination, and it works on saccadic eye movements and reaction times and many, many factors integrated together, but we can also hook a force plate to it. And we can guide the cursor on the screen from target to target by body shift and center of pressure and center of gravity kinds of movements. And then we can also um, having the cursor move by the force plate. And when it reaches the target, you have to reach up and touch it with your hand. So all three things have to come together at the same time. And if we're really mean, and we really want to be tough on the patient towards the end, we add a cognitive load to that. The take homes here um, that I'd like for you to remember, I always, when I go to a lecture, try to get one or two things out of there that, that I can take home and use with patients. Um, and it's just remember that your peripheral vision is your motion detection system. When things pop up there, that's what picks it up, not your central vision. Uh, it's not only sensitive to motion, but it's also very sensitive to contrast and changing light levels and the environment that it's in. It's very fast. It moves at a much, much faster speed than the other uh, systems in the, in the brain and um, in the eye part because it's making a lot of eye movements and it's, it's grabbing that and working with it very quickly. And the last one I had to get the shift happens back into this is uh, sometimes it doesn't play with nice with others and does some pretty shifty things. So we've got one more video here. This is um, one of the peripheral stimulations that we use on the BVT. And I just again wanted to show you how contrast makes a difference. I have not changed anything on that video as far as speed or anything else except contrast. That started out at 10% contrast. It didn't seem like it was moving very fast, but by the time we get to 100% contrast, you'll see it has much more intensity and it makes a, a big, big difference. So obviously in our training, we, we wanna start with low contrast when they get good at it. We step up the game a little bit, go to a higher contrast and a higher contrast. And instead of concentric circles, that could just as easily be uh, OKN stripes moving horizontally or vertically or um, the um, backgrounds that we have in the BVT, such as a grocery store. So, okay, now I'm done. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. I know I have tons of questions. Um, so- um, Don't make it too tough. No, I'll- uh, we'll keep the floor open for everyone else at the end of this. I'm going to run through some slides and uh, I've actually had been uh, sent in some questions that we'll briefly go over. And so I would like to allow obviously some time for you to ask your questions. And, and the best way to do that is, is through chat, which I am doing my best to monitor here. I'm a physical therapist. Um, I've been in this space for 25 years now, only seeing patients with dizziness and balance disorders. I uh, own the 360 Neural Health co-owner, uh, which is educational, but I have also had an outpatient multidisciplinary clinic in Austin where we do vestibular diagnostics and, and therapy. <laughs> what I'm going to do is talk a little bit of going from Charlie's classroom talk uh, to the clinic specifically. This is so brief of, uh, of a discussion on someone that I was working with, with visually induced dizziness. Now, we've heard visually induced dizziness, visual motion sensitivity, visually induced motion sensitivity, uh, chronic subjective dizziness, um, visual vertigo. I just focused on these two terms uh, today of course, they have a history with all those other terms that I just mentioned because 
the literature is really um, focusing on these two acronyms. So visually induced dizziness, which, you know, it's, it's characterized by vestibular related symptoms when exposed to complex visual patterns. Um, you know, your patients are sensitive to the carpet, they're sensitive to certain wallpapers or moving visual stimuli. It's not about them necessarily being in a car of, when we talk about traditional motion sickness. And then there's also the terms, uh, the term visually induced motion sensitivity and that's defined by its authors as a subcategory of motion sickness, specifically, you know, related to nausea, ocular strain, and disorientation uh, when exposed to certain moving or even complex stimuli. And the patient can even be uh, be still, and things are moving um, in the in the periphery. So, what's the etiology of this? It's really pretty. Uh, poorly understood. I think, you know, authors uh, do agree that um, it's a mismatch. So it's, it's, a, it's a deficit in this, in our central re-weighting, particularly multi-sensory inputs. Now, the ones we talk about the most are um, visual, somatosensory, and, and vestibular. And, and as that relates to maintaining our balance, how we interpret where we are in space. And it's also agreed upon that, you know, patients have, it appears they have this over-reliance on visual cues. If there's a vestibular component, which is quite common to have a vestibular event trigger this, um, is there may be vestibular impairments but there's also research that shows this decreased activation in uh, middle frontal uh, gyrus. Now there is also literature that, that disagrees with um, the frontal lobe deficits related. So you, you will read different things. Most of the literature does however, um, find that there is something, a deficit in the frontal, middle frontal gyrus. And these are similar findings that are found in patients with uh, bilateral vestibular loss, uh, malde debarkment syndrome, MVDS, or 3PD. 3PD, um, previous name was chronic subjective uh, dizziness. And we've certainly seen more research in that area. And there's a variety of treatment approaches. I'm um, just gonna highlight here the ones that we hear about the most, which uh, a deep breathing, meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, aromatherapy, a relaxing uh, music. A ginger is pretty commonly recommended for uh, nausea, cognitive behavioral therapy, vestibular therapy. And then of course, there's also the consideration of pharmaceutical management. Um, when we talk about 3P, 3PD, it's usually SSRIs, um, you know, the, so there's different types of medication that may help uh, patients. So 3PD, the top three recommendations are pharmaceutical, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, or counseling, and uh, vestibular therapy. So what does the literature kind of, there's no specific protocol here. These are guidelines. As with all our patients, a patient education is just critical. And the more we can involve the patient in that, both in their development of their care plans, what, is, what does the science say? Patients become more um, involved and more engaged the more you uh, work with them on education. So clearly established care plan and goals, clarity in the home program, expected progression and outcomes. And I know that's hard you know, as a therapist, you know, how quickly is someone's going to uh, progress is a big question mark for us. But what the literature suggests is that we define very specific goals. In one week, I expect this. In two weeks, I expect this. And three weeks and a month, and that we define these, they may be gradual, they may fluctuate, but being very clear on what, uh, on what we expect. If you find in your exam 
there's vestibular deficits, then you can use targeted vestibular exercises. It may be uh, balance related to the vestibular system. It may be VOR exercises. So I definitely come into this with a bias on the vestibular uh, rehab portion of it, but I think the vestibular part's the easiest to predict. For me, predicting the progress with a visual a peripheral central integration, if this is someone um, who fits the characteristics of a functional movement disorder, 3PD, I do struggle with real specific goals, but feel so much more optimistic if I find a vestibular impairment because I do think those are more predictable um, in, in progress. The literature uh, does suggest that it is a gradual progressive exposure to the provoking stimuli. And it, it, it happens to be that the, the most consistent provoking stimuli that you will see in the literature right now is optokinetic stripes. You know, you heard Charlie talk about the concentric uh, circles, which I've certainly, you know, with Charlie's work in this area, we are um, integrating it. We're fortunate enough to also have the Bertex CDP that has the concentric circles that can go forwards and backwards. I'm briefly going to talk about that because uh, today I really wanted to give you an example of um, optokinetic stripes using the, B the BVT. But patients uh, do benefit uh, from proprioceptive inputs. Uh, a lot of you have already been implementing these strategies where you find that patients benefit with like weight vest. Um, I, there may also be just like manual input um, or the use of TheraBands. TheraBands around the waist can be uh, very beneficial. So some of that functional PNF, uh, those PNF strategies that you, you may implement with, with people. I like to start with stable surfaces. Um, again, this is a mismatch, a multi-sensory mismatch and the literature is showing an over-reliance on visual information an under-reliance in vestibular and somatosensory. And you have seen this with your patients where they're on a firm surface and you may take away one input, eyes closed, one input, and they don't tap into their feet even though their strength and their sensations intact. They have those, the startle response, that little bit of sway becomes a big sway so really focusing on just grounding techniques, the use of their big toes, feeling the ground. So I have a tendency not to start on unstable surfaces in, in the beginning um, because I really want to optimize somatosensory inputs. And research also shows improvements, particularly with uh, visual motion sensitivity in hand-eye coordination, coordination tasks, which this is why I really like the BVT. Um, and for those of you that may be interested in, in the use of virtual reality uh, studies, there have been uh, researchers there that have shown doing hand-eye coordination tasks before um, someone utilizes virtual reality can help minimize the motion sickness that they'll have afterwards after the exposure of, of being in the goggles. Okay. So uh, I am hoping that, oh, before my video plays, what I'm gonna show you, so this is just, it's the BVT, um, it's a big TV screen, it's res, uh, shatter resistant, and certainly Charlie can come in and, and give you the specifics since he's the one that designed it. Uh, this is just a sample. I love to use the option of peripheral. Uh, Sequence, there's so many options here. We don't have time to go through go through all the options. Certainly don't hesitate to, to ask questions. Um, is It's about them finding targets in the periphery and you can set where they can see the targets. They know it's predictable or that that predictability isn't there. So I'm gonna give you an example of using peripherals. So this is what it would look like. I, I click, it's a touch screen, right? So I touch on peripheral. The first thing I'm gonna do, and um, again, this is just what I'm accustomed to, is I'm with this patient, I am going to pick the optokinetic stripes. So I just click on the, I touch the optokinetic stripes, it brings up that background. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on the target. So I'm gonna pick a colored target uh, for this patient. It 
just one example uh, that I'm using. Sorry, I'm, I have to intermittently let people in the room here. And then the next thing I'm gonna do in this touch screen is I'm gonna think about the targets scale and maybe you wanna start small and then get bigger. I'm gonna, um, with her, I'm just gonna go extra large. So uh, it's gonna take up the majority of the screen, but I'll, I only wanna start at 30 seconds because of the optokinetic stimulation. Now you can choose less, you can choose uh, more. And I also have a tendency to think about pacing. So these are kind of the areas, what's my background, what's my target, what's my target scale, how long am I gonna have them do it, and what's the pacing? And this is all touchscreen, so it happens, it happens really quickly. And I'm just gonna start her um, with self-paced, particularly with patients with anxiety, because if I do it where it automatically changes, like in one second or a second and a half, then they may um, become too anxious. Like, when's it gonna happen? When's it gonna happen? That's a great cognitive test, right? So they have to be prepared. But I'm gonna start her with just self-paced. As soon as she's successful at touching the target, then um, it'll move on to the next random area. And then this particular screen here is uh, just showing you other options. Like you can change, there's plenty, lots of different background options. You can use the grocery store, you can use blank screens. Um, and there's obviously different types of targets you can choose. You can choose how big the target is, how sensitive. You know, Charlie helped me with a patient one time with uh, left-sided neglect where I wanted her to go over to the left side. So I was able to do a focused target group over here where she had to go over there. And he had recommended in the beginning stages that I allow a lot of room for error. So that target sensitivity was large. And then as I wanted her to be more uh, kind of uh, accurate to the right on the target, and maybe that's what you do with an athlete is um, I could change that target sensitivity. Charlie mentioned this, you can use, uh, the uh, Burtick also has a small portable force plate where they can do weight shifting activities on this and that's multi-sensory where they're shifting their weight, they're going to touch a target. Um, and then the pacing, again, I think I typically start with self and then go to automatic. I start with this, you know, allowing them more time and then having that target switch uh, faster and faster. And again, I'm only talking about the one feature. There's also memory games. There's a contrast. There's um, visual memory, memory learning. And then I've already talked about the focus zone. So there's just a, a few options. And then with her, this would be an initial one where she's a starter on a firm surface. She feels stable. I'm only going to do 30 seconds and it's self-paced. So she touches the target, it moves to the next one. She touches that target, it moves to the next one. And again, I gave her large sensitivity where she didn't have to hit right on the target um, so that to create some success, I don't want it to be too overwhelming. I do want to um, emphasize here, you know, Charlie said, you know, once you've seen one person with concussion, well, once you've seen one patient with dizziness, you've seen one patient with dizziness. It, once you've seen one patient with visual motion sensitivity, you've seen one patient. So it's applicable across our patients. For her, and I just want to share this next slide because you would, you know, the literature has it says that, um, you know, the more immersive, it can result in better outcomes, but it can be a, a result in more motion sensitivity. So, you know, I had mentioned we have the CDP. She actually started in the CDP because she did better in the CDP. I, the BVT was where I started her originally. I didn't even think about getting her to the CDP, but she didn't, she didn't tolerate it very well in the beginning. So when I had her in the CDP, I don't know if it was the harness that she was hooked up to, she felt safe. She did not like wide open spaces. She liked clothes. And so if you're in the CDP, you're in this immersive dome, but a trigger for her, and this was someone who fell into functional movement disorder is 
she went into the emergency department five days in a row with panic attacks and they all happened at work and she was very stressed at work multiple screens and she would go to type and every time her hands were in front of her it would cause her to start having a panic attack so in the dome her hands were at her side i was able i started with a central target even with the concentric circles moving i started with optokinetic i took the target away I did keep it at a slow speed. Um, Fernando Santos, he's a uh, physiotherapist, PhD, also at Burtec, and he's done a lot of research in immersive, the, the huge, fully immersive um, rooms. And he had suggested to me at one time, don't speed up the movement too much, because once it goes so fast, it's almost like they block it out. So sometimes we think just going faster, 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 faster is a progression. And I have, since um, we talked about that, I have kept the movement of stripes a little bit on the slower side. You know, what Charlie's talking about that is so great, great is that with even without changing speed, if we can change contrast, they're going to perceive a different change in speed. So if it's too erroneous, they may not, they may just block it out. And so the um, speed at velocities at which we provide the stimulation, it, it does matter. What I found in the CDP with her is, um, and actually I can briefly mention other things, was always a change in direction or a change in stimulus. So in the CDP, I would have this concentric circles going um, one way and then I would switch it and that would always throw her off. So same thing on the BVT, if, is, if we switch directions. Um, we also did some exercises with her in the strobe glasses, walking on a treadmill where they would alternate um, into flashing and those changes in flashing, it was really the change um, in input that would always kind of make her feel unsteady, but with repetition, she was, her her balance improved. So just, this is just to reiterate um, how patients are unique. You know, I thought she, I would start her on the BVT and progress her to the CDP, but she actually did better in the CDP. And then I took her to the BVT. And you, you gotta remember all those acronyms. That's, that's a quiz at the end. So a progression with her, maybe I stay at 30 seconds and there's no literature to say, what's the best progression? But now maybe I go to auto and now she has, to, it's more unpredictable. It's not just self-paced like, hey, I'm gonna touch this target and then I'm gonna touch this. She had to be prepared. And then I decreased um, the range that she could miss the target and I made that um, a little bit tighter. You can, in once they're successful there, you can increase the duration. Maybe you do want to go to an unstable surface. You want to make the target move faster, but there are, um, you know, a lot of options in how you can progress someone. I'm going to let someone in the waiting room. And I, I appreciate you asking um, questions in chat and I will definitely come back to those. Okay, so this, you know, I really wanted her um, therapy and home exercise program to match. So, you know, I've made, I don't know, over 40 of these videos. They're, they go up, they go down, they go left, they go right. They go 10 seconds with deep breathing and then um, back to the stripes. Uh, they go to 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes. And so this is, she had a desktop at home and this was an exercise that I could give her. And I just started her um, at 10 seconds and then she would follow that with uh, deep breathing. And I wanted her to point to the targets, even though like the BVT, it's actually measuring. I mean, so you can go to select the patient see how successful they were, watch how much they progress. Those can be made into PDFs, they can be uploaded into their EMR. But at home, I, I don't have that, okay? She, but I did want her to point and it's because I wanted her hands in front of her because that's what um, was really a, 
provocating uh, activity for her. Um, so kind of what are parameters for home exercise program? I mean, you know, we may use the, the 20 minute rule. Um, I am less worried about an activity causing you to have symptoms. Um, I, what I really want is to know is how quickly you recover. So trying to move them from focusing on their symptoms, maybe not a journal about their symptoms, but a journal on their recovery. And, you know, and in the clinic, I may use, you know, we may use the five minute rule before we move on to a different activity. But at home is um, the 20 minute rule. I don't want your symptoms more than 20 minutes. And I, I, now that I think about it, a common question I get is, or, you know, I hear with patients is, well, I, I did these exercises and three hours later, I had to be in bed for three days. I, and I've just been curious is I can't, there's no solid literature on it, but it is uh, in talking with providers who specialize in vestibular migraines, visual uh, motion sensitivity is that's probably too long from the exposure to the stimulus to have symptoms. So what was it? Was there something else that happened um, in in the session? I mean, at home that may that may have triggered it. So I'm really looking at keep a journal. You do the activity, rest, see how you feel. Um, within the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes, did you have an increase in symptoms? If so, how long did it take you to recover? So they're not journaling about their symptoms, but they're journaling about their recovery. Let it people let people know it's okay if they don't do their exercises. You know, I want to empower them to your recovery guides your therapy. I'm not going home with you. So if if you're having a day where you do this a little bit and your recovery is 30 minutes, then it's not going to cause any harm, but you're certainly not going to feel well. So let's do it when you're in a better place around your recovery. And that's particularly important in people who may have fluctuating. Uh, vestibular disorders or and or vestibular migraines and just customize, customize. You may need to start OPK uh, exposure at 10 seconds. Determine if they do better with a target, without a target, um, a moving target. So, you know, I the literature has been done with most of it without a target. But what we find is when people have something to look at in the center vision, they do better. But we want to then take that away and have it moving and then maybe no target. But there is much research to know. I'm certainly curious if, if you're using this type of, of treatment approach, what do you find that works? A, a center target, a moving target. I definitely, even though I may start with the center, I do want to eventually progress out of that because patients are already so centrally bound anyway into here, they don't wanna move out into the periphery that it's it's definitely a progression I wanna get away from. Um, determine if there's a direction that bothers them the most. So a lot of people, if they're bending over, well, if I'm bending over, the world's going up. So you might experiment with stripes that go up. Um, avoid general ins instructions like, hey, Google some OPK videos and you can just play them because who knows what, what might, what they might try to watch. You may uh, progress in duration from a sitting um, and, then go, and then go to standing. Okay, let me get through these last few slides. So what about virtual reality? Virtual reality, we all know there's uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, there's certainly a growing interest in this. Uh, Exposure to virtual reality has been shown to increase uh, symptoms of visual motion sensitivity, and it may decrease the effectiveness of the user. So if you're wanting a patient to use it, um, be aware that we have to really know how it affects them. And, and always you try something before you prescribe something. But again, researchers have found that hand-eye coordination tasks help decrease the motion sensitivity uh, from using virtual reality. What are other options? You know, a lot of patients don't have bigger screens. Um, you may not be able to afford this kind of technology. You know, we, before 
Charlie came up with, you know, the BVT and I've seen various forms of it through the years as we would use the science boards, poster boards, and then go buy a material and put over it. We still use those boards because you can, uh, you can put dots in it. We would sometimes, you know, have a moving, a hanging ball from the ceiling moving in it. You can use, uh, some people have used a disco ball, a VOR cancellation exercises, and just peripheral central visual integration exercises, a nasal occlusion, a moving the eyes out into the periphery. So you do not have to have obviously the equipment um, to provide these patients options. How long do I do them? The patient typically defines the duration, especially in the early phases. So you may start again at 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Uh, you may work up to, they're doing exposure to OPKs for two minutes. Um, but in the beginning, just see how they tolerate it and how quickly they recover from the ex exposure. The re researchers do agree that the combination of OPK, vestibular and balance training is the optimal approach. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I'm almost done here. How do I bill? Most commonly is neuromuscular re-ed, which is 97112, a neuromuscular re-educational training. Can I use this in patients with concussion? Absolutely. Just remember these treatment ideas, they're symptom impairment driven, not diagnosis driven. So you may use these in patients with visual motion sensitivity um, due to a concussion visual motion sensitivity after a vestibular event. So we're uh, assessing and we're identifying and objectifying as much as we can, but we're not looking at this as treating necessarily a specific diagnosis more than uh, a patient's uh, symptoms. Comes back to what Charlie said, how important it is to listen to their symptoms. Can they watch these types of videos on their phone? The research says a phone is too small to have any effect. There have been um, an I, a smaller iPad is probably too small. Laptop, maybe desktop better. Uh, of course, you know, this really is the, the bigger, the better immersive sim, uh, simulators are idea, but we know that um, uh, like even the immersive domes or the full, full room simulators are, we don't have access to it. Um, they can be cost prohibitive, but uh, a, Benefits have been shown with the desktop screen, but we do need it to take up uh, a, sig a significant portion of their visual field. And, and Charlie may have more to add about that. So what I'm uh, leaving you here with some contact information, I've got uh, Charlie's email, I have my email. And also uh, if you have specifics about purchasing the BVT, wanna learn more about other options with the BVT, I, uh, provided you with Kevin's email here. We have also applied for as far as education for this for one hour uh, for PTs, PTAs, OTs, CODAs, and then um, we are BOC for providers for athletic trainers. You can also, uh, we sell the optokinetic videos that can be used for a home exercise program. So I just gave you our website. And then um, the CCVR, which is our Advanced uh, Certificate of Competency in Vestibular Rehab. If you're a participant in that, um, you get access to these videos, ocular motor videos, VOR training videos. And um, I mean, you know, I won't, I won't hesitate to just, you know, we love um, the offering of the CCVR course. I mean, I just, in the, the, currently the course is closed. We have over a hundred people in, in this year's course. And I just, you know, learned so much from everyone that's in it. And I think, you know, this is about creating a community with each other. And I saw that someone asked um, in the chat when I was talking, you know, can I reach out to you about questions? Absolutely. This, I mean, I know that I'm where I am today because of the patients that I see, the, the, the mistakes uh, I've made and being able to work with other providers out there, certainly Charlie has taught me so much in the neurooptometry world. So the more we can collaborate, I think the more we can offer, uh, offer our patients. 
Okay, so I am going to look at the chat and do my best to navigate. I'm going to stop sharing my screen as well. Let me do that real quick. It'll give me one less thing to look at. Okay. Uh, Charlie, there's a question for you. Uh, could you explain how bi-nasal and bi-temporal taping works? Um, basically, you're kind of interrupting the binocular vision. Um, the way you would, I, I, you can probably get on YouTube and see how it's done, but um, there's some real good articles too by a Dr. Kafrida at SUNY that if you really want to delve into it, could get into much more detail than I can give you. But basically it interrupts the uh, two visual fields, separates them from one another. And when they're, it's sort of like if you close one eye when things aren't working well, you're more comfortable than having two eyes working against each other. Um, but it's uh, basically just putting frosted tape right towards the inside portion of the glasses uh, at the nasal iris in, on in. So, and, and by Charlie, support, I'm gonna. Up, you've right. got you've got another question here, and then I'm gonna end up sharing my screen again because someone is else is acting for asking for contact information. This is post concussion, seventy percent convergent insufficiency for two weeks. Does that resolve? Is there anything uh, we can do to help patients with this? Um, there's a huge study that was done um, called the CITT study. It was a National Institute of Health study on convergence. And there's a lot of information in there. So I would Google CITT. But in general, when it comes to concussion caused convergence insufficiency, um, it's the one patient isn't the next patient kind of rule again. Uh, the push-ups where you put your finger in front of you and bring it up towards you till it doubles and goes back out is effective in probably only about 10 to 15% of the patients. Uh, you really need to do three-dimensional binocular vision exercises along with that. But short of, if you don't have anything else to give them, hold the pencil out where it's single, bring it up till it doubles. Once it's double, push it back out till it's single and just kind of keep working that up, getting them to cross their eyes. Well, Charlie, you're the winner. You're the winner of the day. Um, is an another question for you. Could you please expand a little more about why blue filters adjust the timing of the M and P cells? We don't know exactly why, how that works in the adjustment of the timing except that the K cells are lying in between them. <clears throat> so if, if the K cells, corneal cells, um, are responsible for integrating M cell activity and P cell activity, and they're sensitive to blue filters, when you put a blue filter in front of a patient and it's stimulating those K cells and they're responsible for the two other types of cells talking nice to each other, that may be part of uh, where the improvement is. The other thing that I should have mentioned with blue filters is that the eye is maximally sensitive to yellow light of about 550 nanometers. So when patients have hypersensitivity to light and everything else, and you put a blue filter on them, you're blocking out the light that they're most sensitive to. So there may be more than one um, benefit of using blue filters. Uh, some people do better with different colors. Um, for migraines, um, there are a rose-colored FL41 tint that was uh, developed by University of Utah that you could, again, Google and get that information. But uh, you really need several different, uh, about four or five of the main colors will handle about 80% of the patients. So. And then uh, Charlie, I have a question. Um, the blue filters and the rose to decrease symptoms, but the yellow tinted 
can really help with contrast. And what you've said before is like in older adults who begin to lose contrast because of affected visual acuity, like cataracts, that can actually help them see better? Is yeah, e exactly, Bridget. Um, for my older patients with cataracts and who are starting to get decreased vision from them, if you see a cataract in the eye under the microscope, it's kind of, kind of got a yellowish tint to it. And uh, it's like a dirty windshield, light scatters from hitting that cataract. Well, blue light has the most energy. So when that blue light comes through, it hits the cataract, it scatters the most. And since the eye sees the best with yellow light, if we use a yellow filter, we're letting the yellow light they see the best with come through and we're blocking the blue light, which is scattering and distracting. Think of those patients as being hyposensitive. In other words, they need more yellow light. They're not getting as much good light as they, as they could. Where the, the concussion patient is the opposite. They're hypersensitive, not hypo. So they're hypersensitive to yellowish light. So if we use a blue filter for them, then um, we're blocking out that light that they're most sensitive to. Okay, and I know we're over the time, but this um, is another. This is a question I'm so interested. I'm going to pose to you. I, uh, my brain is spinning a little bit about um, some theories about it. How does visual motion sensitivity relate to visual fi fixational instability? Well, again, it goes back to that timing that um, when you when you look at how the system works together, the Peripheral vision's the detector. It's telling the central vision where to go. The central vision stays fixated on it until it's processed and you're ready to make the next movement. Well, if you're not staying fixated on it long enough, if the timing's off, if you're leaving the word before it's totally processed, that leads to that fixational instability. Um, the peripheral vision guides the central vision and the Central vision guides the brain is what it amounts to. And um, Denise, I some thoughts and they may be off here, but um, because again, I'm listening from the vestibular world is when, you know, when I, when I think about nystagmus and this was a question that someone in, in our CCVR asked that I thought was so great. It, are we supposed to just memorize that uh, peripheral nystagmus decreases with fixation or uh, and central it doesn't or it increases or are we supposed to memorize it or are we supposed to understand it and um and trying to kind of answer that that question is in the the visual system it obviously has a lot of functions but just to kind of simplify it it's a fixation and gaze stability and to shift our gaze. So in peripheral vestibular, peripheral vestibular dysfunction, the visual pathways remain intact. There's, there's no deficit in the central visual neural pathways in a classic peripheral vestibular dysfunction, which means we can fixate and decrease it. If, if we have the technology, the eyes are make, they make very small movements. Um, particularly those movements get a little bit bigger in the dark. And then there's this central neural pathway that corrects it. So another way that I look at this is kind of wondering if really it's the central, like it's a visual spatial processing issue. It's a central neural processing issue where we're not picking the right uh, sensory reweighting, even though imaging doesn't show anything that it's really internally our central neural network is a little messed up. And so we can't fixate as much on objects um, because of that, of that error message. So I, I do think part of that, um, I would have to think is something, a disturbance in the central neural pathways that fixate our gaze and shift our gaze. And that, um, that's just looking at it a little bit also from a more of a vestibular standpoint. It's a great question. Okay. 
Well, thank you all for hanging in there. Um, we went over, and I know Charlie and I could talk forever. So uh, we will close this uh, webinar where it will be recorded. And please don't hesitate. We're gonna reach out to y'all again to see what follow-up questions you may have, um, recommendations you might have on future uh, topics. So thank you so much. Uh, yes, we can share the slides with that, no problem. And y'all take care and uh, stay safe. safe. Stay positive and test negative. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Goodbye, all. <laughs>